All right, my name is uh, Phil Carl. I'm a high school shop teacher here at Merrimack High School. And uh, welcome to the lab. And today I'm gonna be speaking um, on a couple of items. And one is the hollow form turning that uh, is a great hollow forms in a while is that uh, the, the material that I was used in regards to making these hollow forms are simply branches from uh, my yard and I picked up. And in the winter, there's a uh, increased interest with many lathe turns is that winter is a very, very productive time for turning. And if uh, you're a little apprehensive with regards to entering the, uh, the world of hollow form turning, this type of miniature hollow forms can be a great introduction exercise uh, to start the process. The next step is to cut a piece of material and I have these two hollow forms that I've cut, I've uh, made earlier. This one's kind of interesting. This is uh, from my front yard of the house. Did some pruning uh, a few weeks ago and this is of an Asian plum tree. It's more um, decorative and ornamental than uh, the plums that come off it, they're a bit tart, but there was a particular branch that was cut and it had like five shoots coming off of it and the branch needed to go and I said that is going to be fun, something fun to try about turning. So we even have a little little purple going on in here and you can see with the branches with the knots that were uh, growing off of it and we see the sapwood here and then we see a lot of heartwood here. So with branches uh, when they grow it's elongated and and the pith of the branch tends to be closer to the sun, which means on the top part of uh, the top section of the branch when you cut it. So uh, for a trivia question is that you could say by looking at this, which way was the sun facing? And with the heartwood here, the sun would have been up here. All right, and more sapwood on the bottom. So that's kind of fun. Uh, length, though, is that we're going to be turning a piece of uh, I'm going to be turning a piece of maple again from uh, our back property, and this piece is a little short. All right, I like to have something just a tad longer. So I'm going to put that aside. And here's a piece of maple I believe that I turned a while ago, and approximately about five inches in length is what's nice to use. Uh, you have adequate material for the chuck. You have length here. And I don't want to make too giant, too big of a piece because uh, these are homemade tools and we don't really want a super, you can't, to have to reach all the way down there is very difficult. So uh, I'm looking at my piece of maple that I'm going to be using and what I've found to be a lot of fun is that by looking at the branch we have some little, little um, uh, knots from old branches that were pruned off and we have a little bit of a bend here but this section right here kind of throws up a question mark to me with regards there could be some interesting grain pattern in that and I've got a little bit of a twist so I like using white chalk I'm laying my uh, branch out I want to go perpendicular a nice perpendicular cut so I'm going to be cutting right about here Okay, so hopefully I can incorporate that nuance of that knot into this project. I'm then taking down, this is my five inch long section, and I'm going to be scribing another chalk mark there for my cut lines. So this piece will go away, and we're here at my, uh, here at my favorite Delta Rockwell bandsaw, 1971, standard bearings, and uh, with basic maintenance, it's going to last many lifetimes. So, uh, going to make a cut, and let's turn this on. And it has a break, which is a handy thing. And we had a, we had a very clever electrician here, uh, Walter, at school. And he actually put a stop button down here next to the break so I could turn it off with my foot, which is, uh, which is very handy so you can keep two hands on the material. 
So just also as a side note is that this is green wood, so it's fairly soft, but I do also want to, whenever you're turning, uh, cutting round material, I've cut this many times and I understand the blade's nice and sharp, the table's tuned up, but putting this in a V-block is also a nice idea because the round uh, material, if things aren't set up properly, could catch, or if you're not paying attention, it could catch and this could roll and then bind up the blade and then you have uh, an accident that's happening. So uh, there are precautions, but also you can cut a, a, a wedge and have a wedge behind the board here so we don't have that rotation in the cutting process. So uh, I do want to point that out as well. So let's bring this over to the, uh, over to the Powermatic lathe and we're going to start turning. Now that I have my uh, piece of maple approximately five inches long, I need to install it on the uh, Powermatic lathe, which I do need to point out is that uh, this lathe was able to be purchased and in the shop due to uh, support from the guild, is that this district came up with uh, some uh, resources and the guild uh, wrote a grant and the guild was very generous and supported the school as well. So this was new uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago. and. Um, Derek Weidman, multi-axis, is that correct? He was a guest demonstrator, also uh, sponsored by the Guild, and he did a fabulous uh, lathe turning demonstration uh, that was in conjunction of the Guild's symposium over at Pinkerton, and he just wowed the students all day with making uh, three different animal heads, and that was... Uh, administrators came in and they were so impressed about seeing these artisans and what they do and having uh, students being able to see uh, these world-class turners who are so passionate about what they what they do so that was a real treat so starting off with uh, the maple piece is that we have this center finer jig and it has two one smaller uh, side on here and a larger side here so we need to find the center and as I mentioned with with branches is that you can see that right here is the pith and so you can see we have a greater distance in this direction and we have a shorter distance here so as this tree was growing here is the sun, this is facing up, and this is facing down. So uh, there has been talk, I've been to a few uh, demonstrations where there are uh, individuals say, oh, branch turning, you want to stay away from it because the grain goes in different directions and so forth. But my opinion is don't let that scare you. Um, get a branch someday, put it on the lathe, turn and have some fun with it and just see what the results are. Get a nice idea of where the center is. You're not concerned about the pith location? At this time, no. For this project, I'm not concerned with the pith uh, location. With a larger green piece of material, um, something that was recommended by uh, my, one, of my, one of my many mentors, uh, Dr. Charlie Sheaf, is that he said with uh, hollow form, which I've pretty much exercised that most of the time, is that if I'm doing hollow form turning with a larger project, I do uh, use the pith as the center of the project. And so, and, and I know you can use either side of the center, um, but you can use the center if you have enough material for the design that you're, you're after. So now that I've scribed that side, I'm going to use my scratch all, and I encourage my students to put their thumb down like so. Sometimes early in the morning, it's tough to have a steady hand, so we have a nice uh, indentation there. And then I'm going to flip it over and do the same on this side. So we can see that it's elongated. These are the long ends. So I'm going to bisect that. Just a light pencil line is all we need. Turn it 90 and scribe again. And if we want to have some fun, we can mix it up and change it a bit from point to point. All right, there we go. So there's a pretty good indicator with regards to the center. Scratch all. I'm going to split the difference. And there we are. Now, as I mentioned, I find this and right here the more interesting end. So I'm going to have this be more focused on the top of my hollow form. And this is where my chuck is going to be located. And the chuck that I'm using is a one-way talon. 
and it has a range, meaning I cannot go below one and three quarters of an inch in diameter, otherwise this project is not going to fit in the jaws of the chuck. So it's always good to have an idea of what uh, your limitations are before we get started. And I know that's a limitation, and I have my calipers, and right now my diameter minus the bark is about two and uh, just under three-eighths of an inch. Okay, so it's two, one, two, three sixteenths, two and three sixteenths. So I have a little wiggle room. I'd like to try to end up right around two. So now I'm taking my calipers, and as I tell my students, an inch is an inch is an inch. We don't always have to start at zero, all right? So I'm looking at balance, and I'm looking at five, just over seven. So right there, I'm two and an eighth. I'm going to bring my caliper in. And look at that, right there, five to seven, two inches. So that's where we're going to be. I'm setting up my calipers. All right. So next is installation. Let's install the part. And again, I've looked at it, defects, cracks, barbed wire, any of this. We're nice and clean, no objects like that. Uh, next is that, again, uh, the guild has been so supportive here, is that each one of my lay stations here at Merrimack High School is equipped with the Badger Spur Driver. And this is the design by John Siegel, and I want to say about 15 years ago, I saw one of his demonstrations, and he pulled out of his bag this unique looking spur driver, and I said, I've got to get me one of those. And uh, with... Uh, uh, an introduction to Raycon Tools. John um, communicated with the, uh, the owner, and now we have the Badger. So the Badger is a great spur driver, and uh, I love it here at school because it provides the students, they have the tendency to want to over-tighten the tailstock, and which then can cause pieces to flex and bend a little bit, especially with table legs. And with this, it's just a savior, and it grabs so well that, again, it's been a great time saver for students, and the accuracy of their work has uh, been improved. So my spur driver's in. Time to set this up. And we're going to move the tail stock over a little bit closer. And you're going to see me do something here that I typically don't, but I'm going to have the tail stock a little bit further away than I like. We really don't want the arbor of the, not the arbor, the um, quill, quill of the tailstock extended too far because then it can increase vibration. However, with this particular project is that I need room to move my banjo. So by having the tailstock very close here, I'm very limited to how I can position my, my banjo. So I need more room. All right. And I'm, I'm positioning, as always. So uh, at this point, I'm setting up my tool rest. And the general rule of thumb is you want to set it at center or slightly above center. But that depends on the thickness of the tool that you're using. So um, it may need to be adjusted a little bit below or a little bit above, depending on the thickness of the tools you're using. And as close as possible, to the tool rest. So here, I'm spinning it. You can see it's just almost grazing um, uh, across here and at tool center. The first tool that I'll be using will be my roughing gouge, sharpened up, ready to go. And it will be placed on the tool rest like so, exposing the bevel. The bevel is always angled down 
handle here. Uh, I was brought up in junior high with the underhand grip. Primarily things were uh, spindle turning, uh, but you can choose either under or over, whatever is more comfortable and you have more control with. And uh, we're gonna start off this way. But before we turn any switch on, is course is that you need to be prepared for the safety aspects of things. And sure, we have a spinning object here. If there's any loose clothing, uh, students have lanyards, they have their sweatshirts with the ties up top here, long sleeves, I always roll mine up. And so we don't want anything to get caught in the spinning object, because it's gonna bring you right in, and there's no way that you're gonna be able to overpower uh, a three-phase motor, 220 volts, and uh, I believe it's two horsepower on this, and so uh, there's no way that you can overpower that, so you need to make sure that your clothing, hair, safety goggles or glasses, these are my prescription glasses with side shields, and I almost, well, yes, I always start my turning and I have a face shield. An object can break off of here and it can strike you in the face and have uh, severe damage. So today, since it's green turning and um, taking precautions, is that with the microphone and all, I'm probably going to not use this um, right in the beginning. So that's going to go on the side. Okay. So we're starting off is that I'm gonna use my roughing gouge. It's always nice doing a dry run just to figure out where your feet need to be in regards to balance. I'm gonna rotate and move my ankles and my hips for going back and forth and not the wrists and the arms. Speed. Uh, yes, these are digital readouts and I grew up not having a digital readout. So I'm going to turn it on. So could I tell you exactly what RPMs I'm gonna be starting out? No, but you will get some information. So I'm turning on now, listening. Listens, good, I'm good. Making sure that the tailstock is completely secure. Green turning, the cells are, have a lot of moisture in them, and when you clamp it down, they compress, much like taking a damp sponge and you squeeze it, the water comes out, and it leaves space so that you need to tighten down the tailstock probably about every two minutes, um, about every two minutes. So turn it on, okay, that's good. And that's a fine speed right there. There's no vibration with the lathe, it's nice and stable. And where I'm running, well, just under a thousand RPMs. This is a small diameter piece. So handle down, make contact with the tool rest, you don't need to be white knuckled, you know, no death grip on this, right? They contact with the bevel. It may seem violent, but it's very safe. And now we're gonna engage the cutting edge. So I'm slowly gonna raise the handle until we hear a nice tick noise. Ah, tick noise right there. I'm gonna roll to the right, and now roll to the left. Let the tool do the cutting. Do not push. having these beautiful chips come off the tool. I'm also getting a, a, a tremendous aroma from this maple, and it just happens to be maple syrup season, right? So uh, it's kind of drifting a little bit, all right? So here we are. Contact again. Nice, I'm gonna turn it off. And uh, for years I've taught in a now dealt ed class with regards to wood turning. And uh, one of the phrases I have in the, in the uh, booklet is that discover the beauty under the bark, all right? So I mentioned that piece had a couple nuances with some uh, knots there. I'm looking, I got the nice sap wood here, the bark is moving, ah, oh, there's a couple eyes, right? And I'm just evaluating here because I'm thinking about profile. I'm thinking about how can I incorporate some really nice nuances in this piece into the final um, object. So, check for tightness, tighten it down, very good. My distance is still a safe distance, and we'll turn it on, and 
slightly increase the speed. All right, so have some fabulous chips here. And here's my safety net. Calipers, we measured them. I don't want to go under. Okay, I still have a little room. That is good. So I'm gonna clean off the rest of this park and establish a uh, dovetail tenon. You can see on the end how it's kind of wobbly. Now, if this end made contact with the inside of my chuck, meaning the inside of the jaws, it could have the tendency to skew the object in the chuck while it's being held. So having a wobbly end could be a problem or set up future problems as the project continues. So I'm gonna be taking my parting tool and I'm going to be squaring off the end. This is going to require an additional step in the uh, turning process for installing my chuck. So find the bevel, bring it back, get that chip, and with the parting tool I encourage my students to think of your arm as a, as a pendulum on a clock. Rather than pushing in with your wrists, think about pushing forward from the back of your elbow. And you keep a consistent angle. And I'm gonna bring it right up to the sleeve of the badger. I'm gonna make contact again, and I'm gonna undercut. This is the key. Here straight on. I'm gonna put the tool at roughly a two degree angle, and now I'm gonna press it in like so. Avoid hitting metal on metal. Now, I'm all set up with a flat end, almost. And now I'm going to come in with the uh, dovetail tenon to install on the chuck. I like to go three, three eighths up to a half inch away. I'm gonna go a little bit further, right about there. A bevel, and I'm gonna go five. One, two, three, four, five. Keeping in mind not to go under that one inch and three quarters. Step it over to the left. One, two, three. Over the end. One, two. Now, I'm just going to lightly, hopefully, take those chips off. I'm going to turn it off just for a second so you can see the steps. These steps are, I'm not done yet, but we have steps. And so you can initially see the profile that we're looking for right there. You can feel them. One, two, there we go, creating a, dovetail. creating a dovetail. So now I need to blend those steps. So it's never a good practice to use the parting tool and skate across the top. It may seem like I'm kind of skating, but I'm just using light, light touches and blending. And where am I looking? I'm actually looking on the top and back of the object. That's going to tell us the results of your profile, of what the tool is actually cutting. If you look here where the action is, what you're seeing is chips. And that's not going to tell you a whole lot with regards to the finish line, where you want to end up. So, nice light touches. We don't want too steep of an angle, because I know my one-way chuck, it doesn't require a steep angled tenon. I got a little fuzz right there. Uh, it doesn't want to come off. I'm trying to get it off, but it wants to stay, so we're just going to leave it there. Okay, so there's my tenon. Turn it off. All right. Now, call it a disadvantage or an advantage. Either way, now I'm going to switch this out. I'm going to install it on a chuck, but I have this shoulder here, which is going to be problematic. So, what am I going to do? I'm going to switch out the spur driver. 
And I'm jumping around here a little bit. By extending the quill to this degree, I don't have to keep on moving my tailstock back and forth, which can be a added benefit. All right, taking my knockout tool, contact, hold on to the sleeve. We do not want this specialty uh, tool, fur dryer, to hit the ground. Taking this uh, Sorby, very small, that's at a half inch, half inch uh, spur driver probably, right in there. I'm installing that, reinstalling my work. And how I like to hold on to this is I hold on to the end, I put my index finger out. It takes a couple practice, piece, uh, you know, a little bit of practice making contact here, but if you get in this habit, it then um, makes it quite easy for aligning the tail. A steady rest. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it helps. It takes a little practice. But back to the uh, dropping of tools, a uh, good friend of mine, Dave Shinglinger, he's the shop teacher up at Mascoma Valley, he has a saying that uh, it doesn't matter how expensive a tool is, it all sounds the same when it hits the floor. So keep, let's keep our tools off the floor. Okay, now this will be a little bit more challenging to receive or get a picture of, but we can see this lip on the side. That's going to interfere with the inside of the jaws of the chuck, right there. See that? This is that extra step but it's uh, necessary. So that's going to interfere and it's not going to be good. So I'm going to remove most of that. Now, and I'm going to turn it on. Again, tool rest, find the bevel. This diamond tool has a, uh, it's wider in the center, so I'm going to kiss, this, kiss the edge. There it is. Bevel, bring it back, there's the chip. Angle it at that two degree. Press, press, press. Right there, right before the small spur, uh, Sorby spur driver. Now we're all set for installing the chuck. Okay, so loosen up the clamp. I'm gonna bring this back. Uh, the chuck is gonna stand a little more proud than the spur driver, so I'm going to bring the cupped center back. There's the sorby that goes back in the rack. Now my chuck with key. Now, when installing a chuck, try to avoid trying to spit it on this way. It's very easy to cross thread it. Simply set it into place and turn the hand wheel on the end. Oh, look at that. It wanted, it wanted to catch. All right, but it didn't do any damage. So bring it forward, and then we can start installing the piece. So, doesn't fit. Install the chuck key, and I'm going to tighten this down just to the point so that it doesn't fall out, right there. And you can see the jaws, shoulder, all right, the shoulder of my uh, dovetail is right up against the top of the jaws, so I have contact there, which is important then my angle is pretty darn good. I don't see any daylight there, so my dovetail angle, so I have a lot of surface contact, so it's a very good grasp. Okay, so this is just slightly loose. I'm going to bring forward the quill. Again, align with a little bit of practice. It saves you time, and you don't end up with two different holes on the end. Tighten, 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 and just three fingers. We don't need to over tighten the clamps. Now, I have several students that also spend time in the auto shop. And 
they can understand this analogy. Tighten a chuck, especially with the green wood, it's like tightening lug nuts on, a, on an automobile on, when you're changing tires. Winter tires to summer tires is that one of, and, it's, and the lug nuts we're going to go a star pattern with an automobile with a lathe and the wood and the chuck with green wood several locations let's we've got all this green wood it's compressing can you over tighten it not really okay so why did you do the tightening last yeah, okay, good question. Is that I tighten it now with putting the live center in place with the piece still floating inside here, we're aligning the center axis. We're aligning the center axis of the tailstock up with the axis of the headstock. And then um, by driving that in just a bit and then tightening it, now everything is um, to the best that we can on the same axis. And so that's going to reduce uh, vibration, wobble, and uh, have a better, more accurate cutting. And uh, you'll lose less wood. So you, your project will actually be a little bit larger than if it was um, off-centric. OK, so next is to start thinking about the design. And again, I have some interesting nuances here. I maybe should have cut the top right about here, but it, hey, I did my best guess. This is, uh, this is kind of what's fun. So I'm going to um, pick up my Jacob's chuck because my Jacob's chuck is set with a Forstner bit that actually Charlie Sheaf uh, introduced these uh, during a demonstration he was doing. And these are, this is actually a Grizzly is the brand, but there's all kinds of different brands. Uh, but it's a carbide. So I found these carbide tipped um, Forstner bits to be really, really nice, especially for lathe turning in regards to heat, making chips, not overheating, and clearing it out. So uh, much better than just the standard Forstner bit. Uh, this, I uh, hate. This one I, I purchased through Amazon. All right. um, I'm all for the mom and pop shops. We had a great hammer hardware store down at the bottom of the hill here. Uh, the service was impeccable. However, they're not there anymore. Uh, so, uh, but this is a, a purchase that was on Amazon. So it's, uh, it'd be worthwhile to search around and, and you might be able to find uh, something that is uh, maybe made in the USA or something like that. And so I have this set up for, and I'll give you a number, with the turning tools that I just showed you is that I have found this depth to be a safe depth. So measuring from my tape, to the tip, actually let me go like this, is that good? Um, basically an inch and three quarters, inch and five eighths, any deeper than that with these tools and you're going to lose a lot of leverage and things start getting a little, can get a little scary, a little out of hand. So for this mini project, I wouldn't recommend much, any, any deeper than uh, one and three quarters for the hollowing is a good number. Of course, you can always do less, right? You can always do less. So uh, I'm going to try to keep my hand out of the way. So I'm just getting a rough idea of where this is going to go now. And so I have my tape at the front. I'm going to have a little bit of waste because I have some marks up here that I don't want to stay. So in my mind, I'm thinking I'm going to have about an eighth of an inch waste. And then here's the point. And then here is basically going to be the depth of the hole in the center, so I'm going to pre-drill. And then, since it's green wood, you really don't want anything more than hmm, a quarter of an inch on the bottom. And so, potentially, the bottom of my object is going to be right about there. So I'm getting, laying it out to get a rough idea of how that's going to look. Okay, so taking this out. And many times, for people that have experience, is they'll go right to drilling this now, all right? Which is absolutely fine. But you know what? I'm not really confident in regards to my profile yet. And I'm going to make some cuts here first to distinguish a rough profile saying, okay, I like it. I think I'm going to live with that. And then I drill my whole second. So 
uh, it depends on the person and what you have. And a couple, tool, a couple tools that we'll be using is that a roughing gouge is always a good one to start with. And then we also have the spindle gouge. And uh, this is an old 70s vintage Sorby that is, uh, I tend to go to it less because I don't want to see it go away. <laughs> All right? Uh, it's uh, forged. It's got a tapered flute to it. It's, I believe, high carbon steel. The old one's high carbon, I believe, because when you sharpen it, it gives off a nice white white spark uh, so it doesn't hold an edge quite as long as the m2 steel but it has such a soft feel and cutting that it's just a go-to and uh, when i had john seagull uh, demonstrating here as a guest demonstrator uh, he i pulled out this uh, spindle tool and he looked at it and he goes you know what mr carl he goes if I was, if I had to be on a desert island and there was one tool that uh, I could pick, he goes, it would be this. He goes, this is the tool, one tool that I would have to go with me. So um, that was always fun. All right, let's uh, move our rest a little bit sooner, a little sooner closer. Set it up, keeping in mind how close are we here. Got to keep that in mind. So actually, let me bring this over. And first, what I'm going to do is just a couple sample cuts. I know I have to round the top. So let's just do a couple sample cuts, make sure the top is, uh, see how the wood behaves. And uh, everything is tight, and we're ready to go. So let's turn it on. So here we go, the basic principles of finding the bevel. We do that with all our tools, is the basic fundamentals. Starting, so here, bevel. Uh, oh, look at that, a little chip coming off the nose. I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna ride the bevel right around like so, okay? Just like this. Uh, if, if it works well, don't move your hand too much. All right, Let's bring it back. And it's all with the upper torso. I'm gonna bring it in. Okay, so I should have marked my pencil marks here, right? I'm going to go like this. Here's the bottom of the hole. Here is potentially the bottom of my project. So let's get a visual. So that's what I'm looking at. And if I felt really good, I might be able to get two projects out of here. Okay, bevel and run. Here we go. Nice. Now there's my bottom, so I'm going to start below the bottom, bevel, to the right, bevel, to the right, bevel, to the left. And with lathe turning, as you know, it doesn't require a lot of muscle. There we go. So something I stress with my students that here we, what have we established here? We've established point A and we've established kind of point B. And now this is sort of our canvas in regards to what we have to work with. All right, so let's uh, start roughing, uh, getting a rough shape. Going to go here. This is where Claude might be able to help me out a little bit, is that typically, and I know it's, a, it's more of a scientific question that I just haven't looked up the answer, is that when I go from center here and I do a left-handed cut, there's a tendency for want to, wanting to hop. And so I'm getting off the bevel a little bit, a little bit more on the nose. You can kind of hear it, but frequently, oh, there we go, hear that? The hops. Now, we know that the cell's grain goes this way, so I'm kind of shearing off the end, but I'm still getting this hop. And you can see the wavy action right here with that beginning of the hop. However, when you go from center to right, it, tends, it doesn't tend to happen that way. So, just an idea. Not sure. We might have to ask John that one. Yep. All right. Might have to ask John. So. Um, Way that could be two, yeah. So here, all right. So, and here, I'm actually pushing down versus in. You know, let the wood come to the tool versus you pushing the tool into the material. Here we are. Okay. Let's take a little more. See, there's the hop. 
So if you end up with that situation where you're getting a little hot, you know, we want it to come out well, and we've got to use the resources we have. The roughing gouge, Gord, this is quite large, and we've got to be careful of the space we have here. But you can also obtain pretty decent results with your roughing gouge. But it's not going to do everything. Before I get too carried away here, I do have to drill a hole. So I'm kind of going from the top here all the way down. There's another technique where you can start at the bottom and then work your way up. All right, but you're going to end up with a lot of steps, and so you need to have an idea or a plan in regards to how to remove those steps. So I think it's time to drill. Oh, all right, a little bark, a couple uh, knots. We'll see what we end up with. Oh, kind of an interesting little grain pattern there that should uh, show up nicely. Now it's time for drilling, so I'm going to just move a couple of tools. Time for drilling the hole. And as I mentioned, I have the, my Forstner bit and the tape, and uh, I, we know it's going to go approximately an inch and five eighths, inch and three quarters into the object. Uh, at this time, it's important to take a, a moment and check tightness of your chuck. So, let's see if it moves. Slightly. All right, so that's, that's reassuring that uh, what I did earlier worked well, and I'm still gonna check it about every two minutes, but I feel more confident that it's not going to vibrate on me. Here's the uh, Jacob's chuck with the Forstner bit. Oh, what size? What size Forstner bit? Of course, with hollow form, we always want to challenge ourselves and have the smallest hole opening possible. But right here, this is a half inch. So uh, I would recommend starting off with a half inch or something more, uh, a little bit larger. Uh, what we want is success. And we can't have success unless we develop skills. And in order to de develop skills, you need to make chips. So uh, don't make things over difficult. All right, so you need to capitalize on the skills that you have and then grow from there. So I've just installed the Jacob's Chuck into the quill, extending it just a small amount. Here, we don't want the quill extended too far because it's gonna um, possibly add to vibration, which a vibration and lathe turning is evil. Yeah, all right, you don't want you, you don't want any vibrations. So here we are, and again, um, seeing a demonstration with Dr. Charlie Sheaf in regards to hollow form, he made out a very good point. He goes, whenever we're drilling, you need to put wrap your fingers around the Jacob's chuck, and then make contact with your quill because so we're going to be drilling in, and then the drill bit needs to come out, needs to exit. And if we have the Morse 2 taper separate here, you're going to end up with a wobbly, heavy Jacob's chuck inside, you know, connected or in contact with your project, and it could rattle around and then break out the side. So uh, do hold on to your hand, do hold on to both. All right, I'm going to turn it on. I'm presently at just over 1,000 RPMs. In my opinion, that is too quick. So, uh, you know, this isn't a race, it's all about success. So, where are we at? Oh, just about 800, but again, it's a small diameter, right? So, here we are, I've got my grasp, I'm gonna move it forward, here's the contact here, there we are. So, what I like doing is feed, pause with just a quarter of a turn back. Feed and a pause. Now with this carbide uh, cutter head uh, tip, it can um, withstand heat a little bit better. There we are. And there's my depth right there. Now you can continue to exit with it spinning, but if you have the chance to turn it off, turn it off. Now, 
something with the bit is that with this depth of about an inch and three quarters, it creates chips, all right? Right now, the flutes are loaded up. All right, look at this. It's all loaded, packed in here. So if this was a two or a two or a quarter inch hole, you would have to exit, clear the flutes because they would pack up in there. And then there's a chance with this wet fiberish material that it's gonna, the, the bit's gonna get jammed in here and stuck and you're not gonna be able to pull it out at all. So uh, don't rush, but uh, do clear the, clear the chip. Okay, so there we are. Okay. Now, I have my air hose. We do have chips inside here, so it's time to clear them out. Sorry. Okay. Uh, here we go. Woo! All right. All right, now that we've moved the Jacob's truck and the drill bit, it's time to clear out uh, the sawdust. If there's any in there, uh, we don't want it. Uh, cluttering the area for the cutting, so okay, cover it like this and that uh, clears it out nicely. And now I need to reposition uh, the headstock near the end for hollowing. And so uh, this lathe is equipped with a uh, swing away. So I can bring the tail stock to the end, to the swing away, tighten it, and then loosen up the cap. Then we can swing it away. Next to it, I found when you do remove or swing the tailstock away is that when you move the banjo to the end, if you simply put two fingers here at the end of the bedway, you bring your banjo there. That's a good placement for the banjo. Next, we have the headstock, and with the paramatic lathe, I love this uh, accessory in which we can bring it forward and allows you to stand at the end of the lathe for turning. So it's uh, much more ergonomic for your back. And bringing it forward to right about there, grab the handle. Step on your left leg, Ooh. give a good tighten, like so. And now we get to use our newly made tool. And this is something I learned from, again, uh, Charlie Sheaf, is that when we're hollow forming, the cutting edge of your tool right here should be smack dab center axis. So I'm holding the tool horizontal, so level. I'm bringing it forward and you can see it make contact with the bottom of the hole. So that means the tool rest needs to be raised a bit. So let me raise the tool rest. There we are. Check it. That looks pretty close. So what I've found is that if you're above center and you engage the cutting edge, it can get a little grabby. If it's below center and you engage the cutting edge, it can get really grabby. So uh, there's that sweet spot that's right smack dab in the middle. And I think I'm really close to that. Next thing, I like to have the tool rest itself a little bit closer. And you can see how it's angled. If this is a larger hollow form, it's nice to have a place to put your hand where the turning object is not gonna make contact with your skin. So this uh, provides that opportunity for it not to make contact. One other item that I need to put on this newly made tool is I need a, a little line right here. So I'm putting the cutting edge horizontal, not angled down, not angled up, but level. And I'm gonna put a little pencil mark right here on my handle. Because when this tool is inside this object, how do you know whether it's down or up? I can simply look at my pencil mark and that will be determined. So we enter with a cutting edge down. 
we enter and then we slightly turn up to engage the cutting edge and in the very beginning we have uh, lots of uh, material that's going to build up really quickly and so we're going to have to blow out the air here now that the uh, center hole is drilled, is that it's time now to install, I have the 60 degree cone center, and this is just gonna help for stabilizing reasons. So the tailstock is gonna come back a little bit. We're gonna move this forward. And again, this is further than I really like to have the quill extended but it's just for stabilization to cut down some vibration. Now, how tight am I gonna do this? I'm gonna go about that tight. Any more, and it's gonna split the object right in half. Now I have room to manipulate my banjo. Wow, look at this, I'm still pretty close, within a half inch, that does not make me... So I just loosen up the handle, and simply by turning it, I can get a little more clearance. Slight tug, and there we are. Okay, now I'm more comfortable with that. So let's finish up the profile. Then go back to my spindle tool. And I have some diameter here. I have my Jacob's chuck, and I need to revisit where the bottom of the hole is, which is approximately here. So then I want my bottom to be there, about a quarter inch below. I want to give myself a little wiggle room, if we can see that. Okay, so to keep things simple, again, I need my point A and I need a point B. I'm going to take out this thin parting tool, save some wood, and I'm going to make a cut here, what's going to be the bottom of the object. So we turn it on. Let's get a more defined line here. Bottom of the hole. And bottom of the object. There we are. Nice. Now things look a little clearer. And I'm going to come in with my parting tool. Up, go straight in to about here. I'm just going to go a little bit wider. Just make a couple, couple points. I don't want to make it too small here uh, because you still have to hollow it out and there's a lot of forces there. So that's all I need for that point, point B. Later on, when I come in after the shape is all done and it's hollowed out, I'm coming in at a slight angle to undercut it so that when it's finished, it's not rolling around like Humpty Dumpty. All right, now it's time for shaping. So, I have my top. Let's look at proportions. And something I share with my students is that watching the guild sponsored, uh, was it Mike Mahoney uh, Zoom? Oh no, my, it was Trent Bosch's Zoom. Uh, I, I, I did observe that. He mentioned the golden ratio. And the golden ratio is something that's uh, in so many elements of uh, our world, architecture as well as nature. And this is a divider that this is basically one third and then this is two thirds. And so if you're not confident about the golden rule of proportions and how that is uh, if you exercise the golden rule of proportions, things tend to look balanced. They tend to look natural. And so this is a way for students to uh, reinforce their, their instinct. Um, I don't like them using this first. I like them plotting things out first, and then we can check with this if it needs to be refined. So I have one point here at the bottom, and I have one point here at the top. Now, this would be if I wanted the top part to be a narrow neck, two-thirds narrow neck, and then very thick at the bottom, which I don't want. So I want it to be a smaller proportion on the bottom and a thicker proportion at the top. And so there I am showing it there. 
So here's the top, here's where the largest diameter of the mass is going to be. Here could be a transition from larger mass down to smaller diameter. So you could do some pencil marks and help reinforce that. I think in the box this, this is actually called like an eyebrow divider. So um, here we go. Oh yeah, it's called uh, eyebrow golden proportion proportional ruler. Okay. Can increase the speed just a tad. Now also with this being green, moisture's leaving and you can all of a sudden say, wait a minute, it was perfectly round before and now it's starting to change its shape a little bit. It's a little bit of bounce. And that can be due to the moisture leaving the material. So starting here, I know I need to take Rather than going with a straight profile, I'm going to try to have a slight radius here. It's in nature, there's very few things that are perfectly straight and flat. So you can hear that hop again happening. We are having some pretty good chips. Here we are. Just going to clean up this top edge a little bit. is starting to do me in. Okay, looking at the proportions here. With some slight ridges. Do you think we can speed it up? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go too much smaller on the bottom here because I need enough material to support the cutting process. However, we do have another technique to help smooth this up. This kind of bothers me a little bit, and we can use a scraper. And um, this is just a uh, flat scraper, but it has a slight radius to it. And again, it's one of those old sorbies that works quite well. And I'm just going to go over it just to see what the finish looks like um, to see if it's... Uh, a right strategy. Now, something with these small hollow forms, I'm right-handed. I am crunched up a whole lot over here. So guess what? It's time to start learning how to turn left-handed. So this can also reinforce learning and feeling a little more confident about left-handed turning. Yeah, that, that was needed. Time for hollowing. 
All right, with hollowing uh, is that we're fortunate with this uh, paramatic lathe that we can slide the headstock all the way to the end and work right off the end of the bedway. So I'm going to retract. and eject cone center. This comes all the way back. I always think it's going to fall on my feet. But these swingaways, again, the guild supported us on, the, on this purchase, is that I had nightmares one night with regards to seeing students pull these off and having them having to lift the tail stocks from here to the bench and having them land on their feet. And that sent um, quivers and a couple of sleepless nights. And so I knew it was uh, definitely needed to have the swingaways. So bringing the banjo, I like putting two fingers down right about here. That's a good distance for the banjo. Turn the tool rest, and now I know where to go. Point A, point B. Here we are. Okay. Key with hollow form turning. Uh, Dr. Charlie Sheep, watching one of his demonstrations uh, with hollow form turning, uh, had the suggestion is that the cutting edge right here needs to be at the exact center axis of your object. So right now, I'm a fair amount above. So I'm going to lower the tool rest. Plus, I have it at a slight angle going away. I'm right-handed. So my left hand has a place to be without interfering or being too close to the object. So here I am, still too high. Let's lower it down. Tighten it up. That is probably pretty close, pretty close. All right. There. And with our turning tools, so this was the first Allen wrench spindle tool um, that I used. And you can see this one's straight. You do have the option, depending on how much room you have, to start off. And you can see my little pencil mark right here indicating where the blade is totally horizontal. So you could enter with it slightly angled down, go in, open the face, and do some cuts. So uh, depending on the size of the hole, you might not be able to have this corner, this hook, enter in a balanced way, in a secure way, and so you may have to start off with a straight spindle tool. Okay, so I'm going to do a sample cut and see which one I need to use. Here we are. I'm going to angle it down, make contact, all right, that's safe, and now I'm going to turn the more horizontal. I'm going in, pulling towards me, towards me, towards me. And once you find that nice angle, you can go down, you angle the cutting edge down, enter, up, pull, down, up, pull. So there's a rhythm, there's a cadence to this. I'm feeling some resistance when I go to exit the tool, and that's because I have a fair amount of sawdust build up there. And it's going to build up most rapidly in the beginning because there's really no space for it to go. Scraping? Scraping, yes, yeah. So. there'd be more than that. <laughs> All right. So uh, you can also take a little peek in there. We're making some progress. Again, enter, down, the scraping.
I have an additional one that's a little less uh, of an angle on it, and I, I want to work on a spot that's inside here, so. There we go. Hear the difference? A little too much of a bend on uh, entry. And one of the beautiful things with this uh, hollow form turning is that you know, it's blind turning. You can't see what's going on there, so it's really reinforcing your senses. Your senses on feel, on how the tool is cutting and what it feels like, sound, on how um, it sounds in the cutting process. And so it's a way of like sort of escaping from what you see to these other elements of, of, of your senses, and it can be very, very rewarding. Now, what I'm just noticing here is a little crack. So right here close to the pith, we have a slight crack that is developing, and here we are, CA glue. Don't be afraid to use it. It will bite us in time. So uh, it's very dry in this room. It's about 20% moisture content in the, in the shop. And so whenever you've, we turn green wood here, it dries out so rapidly that, um, yeah, we're going to need to uh, have the CA glue handy to control the cracking. Okay? Nice. So since it stops, let's uh, make sure the air's out. I mean, the sawdust is out. Take the moment. Double check the chuck. That is fine. There's no need to use a catalyst on the super glue? Uh, we could spray it first or afterwards. And something, um, this is the thin viscosity. So it tends to take up pretty quickly, but I do have the uh, accelerator that would uh, then um, cause it to cure up much faster. Because if it is wet and you turn it on, it's going to spray at you, uh, which is not something you want. Or you could take the time right now and we have these offset close quarter drills and with the CA glue there we could just turn this on maybe with a 120 grit sandpaper and do a quick, a quick touch and it's going to generate some sawdust which will help fill in the crack and make it a little less visible. So that would be something that could be done now as well um, if, if you didn't have the accelerator. There we are. So again, angle it down, no scrape. One thing I like about this tool is that uh, I have a half inch hole here and this is a little bit less than a half inch wide. So when I go straight in, I can feel where the bottom of the hole is that I drilled in regards to navigating inside there. My new tool right here, this is a little bit bigger than a half inch. And so uh, trying to find the bottom is uh, a little more testing, a little more testy. So I'll do another pass. I'm hearing a tone difference. That means the wall thickness is uh, changing. Oh, 
Okay. So now I'm at the point where I need to do a more accurate assessment of my wall thickness. And we can do a, a, a general guesstimation by having your tool, and I'm putting it at an angle in the opening, moving it forward to it stops. See how it stops? I'm taking my index finger, putting it right here on the rim, and then if you pull this out and you duplicate that angle, you can look straight down from the top of your cutting tool and you'll get a rough idea of how close you are to the outer diameter of your piece. So, I have a little bit more material to remove there. Let me check that again. I'm going to go like this, angle it in, here, there we go. I'm about here, so maybe I have a wall thickness of 3 16 quarter, quarter inch almost. I can go down a little bit further here, duplicate that angle, and down below, I'm a little bit closer. There's another technique that I like using, and that is with the flashlight. It requires an additional step of moving your banjo, and when we turn this on, if you see any illumination, then that means you're getting pretty thin. So I have a good, th the, the thickness is appropriate there. The maple that shows up nice. Something that's going to be deceiving though is that if your piece of material has heart wood in it, it's dark, it's going to absorb the light more. So you're going to have an a, a inaccurate reading with regards to the illumination with that. But as you know, if you use poplar, you could end up with a, and you, and you um, machine it here so it's fairly thin, you could end up with a little miniature light bulb, right? Peter Block. Peter Block with his lamp, uh, illuminate lampshade. Uh, with his lampshades, he uses poplar, and that has a very nice sort of translucent illumination with light. And uh, I'm sure that would be fun, which I haven't used yet as poplar with these. So there's the illumination. So, and then uh, we can also take a peek in. All right, and I can see now with judging that the wall thickness is um, still a bit thick. This flash I like, I saw this on the uh, Guild's um, um, sponsored event with John Jordan, telescoping, plus it swivels. So if you get into larger hollow forms, this is a great, great accessory and not all that expensive. You can find them at Home Depot and online. Okay, back to, uh, I'm pretty good on the shoulder. Let's uh, continue. Okay, that's pretty good. Getting close to the bottom. Another direction you can go is you can go from the outside and you can look in and you'll see illumination on the inside, which I don't quite see yet. I'm going to try the longer reach of the new tool. sign.
So my next step is that um, I'm just going to refine the top here a little bit and then establish the bottom. So. Let's get the uh, tailstock back in place. My favorite uh, small spindle gouge with this wrench. And this is, um, this is about a 40 degree angle that's on the end. So it's a standard uh, 40 degree angle that you would find pretty much on your uh, uh, spindle tools. And I'm just going to roll the edge here a little bit. Give it a little character. Okay, and the bottom, oh yeah, that is now gone, mm -hmm. so I'm going to reestablish where my bottom is. Here is where I want to be for there, and I think we're really, really close. I'm going to come in with uh, the thin curve parting tool. I'm going to stay. I'm going to go on the outside. And I'm going to go on the inside. And now I'm going to go right on the pencil line. Angle in. Remove some of the excess. And I'm going to bring it down to a diameter 3 16 Now this is green turning, so we don't want a thick tenon here because it's going to dry out if I leave it on the uh, dovetail tenon. So if you wanted to sand it and get a coat of finish on it. Okay. At this point, I've just used the uh, parting tool to come up with a base. I've cut in, and I'm going to just refine the base, so I'm going to undercut it, which means I'm making contact with the side. I've gone in a little bit, and I'm going to angle it basically at a two degree angle going in so that when the object is fully cut from my tenon here, it will only sit on the outer edge, so it won't be humpty dumpty. Now I'm also going to take my little uh, spindle tool here, and I'm just going to put a little bevel on the end. You could certainly do it with sandpaper. And that just, I think, gives it just a little elegant closing. And then with sandpaper. So you have two choices. One, you can cut this off now. And then if you wanted to sand it and put a coat of finish on it, it would all be by hand. Or if you wanted to cut this off and do wood burning or paint it or anything like that, you could certainly uh, go in that direction at all and you would end up with something like this. However, if you're looking at finishing it on the lathe and this means sanding it and a couple coats of oil and a nice coat of wax, you need to leave it on the dovetailed tenon. And with doing that, and this being green wood, it's going to dry out. And when it dries out, and I put it in a paper bag, put it in a paper bag, roll it up, when this green wood dries out, especially with how thick it is, it's going to crack. You do not want a crack traveling all the way up from your tenon through this stem part and then into your object. All right, all that work would have been gone. So uh, Dr. Sheaf demonstrated this, is that use super CA glue and glue the stem. And that prevents 99% of the time from any sort of crack venturing off and up into your part, as long as the base here isn't too thick. So if it's 3 16 thick from the bottom of your hole to the bottom of your, your object, you should be okay. So I'm going to 
uh, use a little CA glue and apply it to the stem. I'm just going to turn it, kind of wiggle it, cover the end. Nice. And then on this side, if you wanted to do a little bit up here for insurance, if you had a pith or a knot that was right here or on the bottom, you could do that as well. And let's get the bubbles out. And then, depending on how much time you have, is that you can use the activator and just give it a light spray. And then it typically cures up in about 15 seconds. Now, something that uh, Beth Ireland showed me way back when was that if you, ha you can also put the activator on first and then hit it with the glue. And that, uh, that's another technique that has its benefits in certain situations. All right, so that's curing up. Uh, I've got the top. I'm going to step this back, meaning the tool rest. And let's move the quill back as well. And one last thing before putting it in a paper bag, I kind of like to take, so we got some fuzz here. I kind of like taking a you know, 100 grit, 120 grit uh, sandpaper and just uh, roll it up. We never want to stick your finger in and have the sandpaper attached to it because it can grab it. So I'm just going to enter and I'm just going to round this out just a little bit. Open it up. Get any of those fuzzy marks off. That's all we need. Okay. And let's take our mini hollow form off. Almost there. And then we have it. So all from a branch from the backyard. And we have some interesting um, branches that have uh, sprouted from it. Uh, I think it's a pretty nice form for the most part. Uh, of course, it will need some sanding. So the next stage would be to place it in a, in a brown paper bag. And that, over about a day or two, you could have a smaller one, smaller bag than this. But what I've found is that if you have a large hollow form or a green turned bowl, uh, we've experimented over the years, and I've found that if you put the opening of your object, whether it be a bowl or a hollow form, upside down into the bottom of the bag and then roll it up tight, it creates a micro environment inside uh, your object, your bowl. It evaporates slowly through the walls into the airspace of the bag and then evaporates through the paper of the bag. Having it like this, it tends to be a little bit faster evaporation. And my personal take is you can put it upside down. You can roll it like this. All right, it's upside down here. It's a little micro environment. And tomorrow, take a look at it. You'll get a little puff of moisture coming out of the top of the bag. Put it back in. And within two to three days, it'll be dried out perfectly and ready for sanding and then the coat of finish. All right. So thank you for uh, your interest into miniature hollow forms. Uh, they're great fun, uh, and uh, it's a great self-confidence. You find out what things are, you know, branches and so forth, that may uh, be interesting to turn, and it's a great intro exercise. So thanks again.